Hello, everyone. Welcome to our sixth episode of Move for a Movement. Today, we have Jenny Oliver, a Boston-based uh, dance artist, choreographer, educator, all-around awesome lady. And thank you so much for being here today, yeah. Jenny. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be of here. Of course. How you doing? I'm okay. You know, it's Monday. It's sunny out. It's warm still in New England, so I'm not going to complain. Nice. Nice. Sunshine always helps. Um, yeah, jumping right in. Excuse me one second. My computer's doing strange things. Um, yeah, I am so fascinated by this, this. This paragraph on your website really struck me. Um, and I'd just like to read that aloud. Um, the mission of the collective, your uh, modern connections collective, um, is to create research-based choreography reflecting themes, ideas constructed from the indigenous diaspora and socio-political events of today that contribute to the, fa the fabric of the American perspective by actualizing a route towards philanthropy through the fortification and support of marginalized communities, CDT aims to be the vessel of hope to all audiences. Love, love. Um, yeah, I, I'm wondering about themes there. There's so much to unpack. Um, first, what would hit me is this connection of the indigenous experience and the black experience. I think of the term BIPOC. Um, and I didn't know actually reading your, your bio that you are both black and indigenous, you identify with both those groups. Um, yeah, I'd love if you could speak to sort of the connections there, shared struggle, uh, common experience, solidarity, and how that fits into your work. Yeah, um, so I am, um, like you said, both black and native. I'm actually native to Massachusetts. So I have tribal membership with the Massachusetts Five at Ponkapog. Um, and I'm so grateful to be able to be able to represent that for my family and for the tribe itself. Um, I'm also Cape Verdean, um, so that's the black side of me. And I was raised very much African American. And so this idea, these ideas about um, native identity has come a little bit later in my life, partly because I sort of resisted it. I, as a young person, I was just like, I want to be doing all the things and I want to be out with my friends and I want to, you know, so it wasn't until much later that I kind of was like, oh, shoot, I have a responsibility, you know, mm -hmm. and I have a voice. Um, and that voice mm -hmm. needs to be used, especially when we're, when I'm here on my own ancestors land. Um, mm -hmm. So this common struggle of indigeneity and being black, I mean, it was very strategic way back when, uh, hundreds of years ago, it was very strategic for um, black folks, enslaved folks and native folks to create alliances together in order to survive. And so this idea of like common struggle really was strategic as far as like how we were gonna deal with it and how we were gonna make sure that we continue on. And I'm so grateful, you know, to my ancestors that were able to do that. Um, so that I could be here. Um, so I think that there's a lot to, un like you said, to unpack. I mean, I think that as Black folks, you know, we're constantly on the margins. And as Native folks, we're like, not e sometimes we're not even hitting the margins yet. You know, people think that we've disappeared, that we've just been killed off. And that's definitely the narrative of the, of the dominant culture, you know, and I think that that's part of the point is to like erase everybody you know what i mean so that we can all just say like kumbaya we're all just like human beings and people and start to uh sort of level the playing field when the playing field was never level anyway mm -hmm. um so the work that i like to do is really about a lot about my own experience at this point right now um i come from a long history dance wise of dance historians and activists and people that really have embodied movement for justice, movement for understanding, movement to process, movement to document our experiences from our own voices and mouths and ideas. And I just want to continue that legacy um, and make sure that the next generation after me, and to be honest, the next seven generations after me, have, you know, sort of this blueprint to go forward and, and can understand that whatever struggles it is that they're facing, that they're not facing them alone, and that although times change, 
you know, the, the situation is pretty much still the same, you know, so a lot of my work is really trying to hold true to my perspective and my experience while opening up, opening up to the public and allowing them to sort of come in and sit with themselves, you know, as I sit with myself all the time. Mm. Yeah, there, there's so much there. I'm thinking about, you were speaking about those alliances um, with Native people and Black people. I didn't learn that in history. It's like this erasure, which you were know, speaking also about like, oh, you, like, they didn't kill you all off. I've actually, I've heard that. <laughs> like, Native people say that they've been told that at conferences and you're just like, <laughs> but yeah, and a way to work against that erasure with art, right? With the stories you put out. Um, these stories of experience and struggle and, and sharing and working all those beautiful things that art can do, that can be such an amazing force. Yeah, and I'm also one of those Native people that was totally disappeared. <laughs> In elementary <laughs> school, you're like, and all the Natives just like got up and moved west, like Fifo goes west, like what? You know, and so how do we, um, how do we come to terms with that, right? Like how do we reclaim that so that I can be, you know, more of a voice and more of um, reflect back the reality, you know, which is not always an easy thing, especially when the dominant culture is as dominant as it is. Yeah, and it's a tool for power erasure. Yeah, well, I think that, and I also, I also want to say because I think that it's important, um, you know, especially or I should say, particularly with my tribe. I don't really speak for other tribes. Um, you know, we participated in colonization, right? As a form of survival. We knew that if we didn't get on board, that was gonna be the end of us. And so when we're thinking about colonization and even thinking about my own narrative of like accepting that all natives just kind of disappeared, like that was also a tactic that we had to do in order to like make sure that I could still be here all these generations later. And so now I'm sort of kind of going backwards, which is a little bit, there's a little bit of friction there, of course, because we made a choice to participate and to assimilate into this. And now here I am in 2020, like, I don't want to do this anymore. And so, you know, how do we come to terms with, with you know, the realities of the things that we had to do to survive? And then now the things that we do, we're, we're able to really have a platform and have a voice. Yeah. Yeah, that, that resonates with me. Um, I mean, of course, not apples to oranges a bit, but, you know, my my mother is first generation Italian American. Her ancestors had to do a lot of assimilation, and they made that choice for safety. And they could because they were white. <laughs> That's all. But um, yeah, and like what was lost there, right? But what would have happened if they didn't? I think are, are really pressing and important questions. Um, before I go off on more on a tangent, anyways, uh, just I was speaking a little bit about the power of art for these purposes of connection and solidarity, etc. Um, I remember a beautiful work. I think you're still doing iterations and things, um, so kind of work in progress, but um, the Water Over Raised Fists about how water is so important in different um, points in history and now uh, when marginalized communities have been denied the access of the right to water. Um, yeah, I wonder about how that came together, what that process was like, how your experience. Um, with your identity informed that. Um, yeah, I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I really feel like hot water over raised fist is like both sides of me in a way. Um, mm -hmm. Although the two themes that I focused on in the show were not necessarily directly related to New England, I think that part of that choice is just like, I wanna unpack that for myself and I need a lot more time to like come to terms with like when I'm telling my own story here that relates to our lands. Um, but talking about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, and all of those marginalized communities, whether they be Black communities or whether they be poor communities, whatever the case is, and in a lot of ways, when it comes down to water rights, it's not really across racial lines. It's across, you know, economic lines and where your stature yeah. is in the world. So um, marginalized in that sense is really about all of those people and their experiences. Um, but of course, always focusing, I think, the perspective and how I process the information that I'm learning or that I've learned about Flint is always going to come from this Black perspective, even when I'm speaking or when I'm um, sharing about a crisis that's as big as something that, that affects 
both black and white and immigrant communities. Um, and then the other side of that of hot water resist was uh, focused on the pipelines at Standing Rock. And if you came to the show, I'm just kind of talking out into the into the public here. You can audience members. I love the refresher. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, if you came to the show, the, the show not, didn't only focus on that, although those were the two main themes. Yep. You know, we were talking a lot about, you know, pipelines in general and the privatization of water here in New England that's happening right underneath our noses in Rhode Island. And if you mm -hmm. go all the way up, up north, the dams that are being um, put up that are going right through Native territory where it's really influencing the way that they are, it's changing the culture of Native people. And it's really from this like dominant, again, dominant culture perspective that like, well, we can just come in and do whatever we want. And because our system is like, we can like vote, we can have a vote. And if everybody in the community or the majority of the community votes to do this thing, then we're going to do it. Or we're going to privatize water because we can. Um, I think that that's really problematic. I think it's not something that we're really talking about and not because they don't I don't think it's because we don't want to. I just think that there's like literally so many things going on. And when you really narrow it down to your own life, it's like how much can you really, how much of a container do you have to hold all of these, you know, systemic injustices that are affecting people, which again feeds right into, you know, this sort of uh, capitalist dominant society that's like, well, y'all are going to be too, we're going to keep you so busy struggling in your own stuff on a day to day that you're not even going to be able to like, process or participate in the larger things. Um, and so creating Hot Water Over Race Fist really gave me an opportunity to sit with, you know, both of those themes and figure out how can I amplify those stories? How can I pull and connect those strings to what's happening in New England? And then how can I motivate the audience to do something that's actually going to create some sort of impact. I understand that it's very ambitious to feel like I'm going to make some kind of crazy change, but we were able to raise, um, I don't even, I think we raised almost $2,500 for um, the Ganese Intermediate, um, oh, what is the name of the school? Oh my goodness, I'm, I'm the name of the school is okay. so slipping my tongue, but there's a, a, a childhood, early childhood center in Flint that really was sort of the topic of the Flint section of the performance. We were able to raise money for them um, and get them some resources because a lot of what's happening there is still going on even though it's not in the news. And then also raising the awareness of what's happening with these water dams and with pipelines here in the East Coast as well as what's happened at Standing Rock and then having a call to action to support Native communities here. And so that push was really for the legislature that's up um, mm -hmm. in city government here about creating Indigenous Peoples Day and removing, you know, this very inaccurate representation of the flag and um, all of those kinds of things. So really using art as a tool to educate, activate, and then put your money put your money where your intention is and like do good. Or like here's a template of how you can email or write a letter to your representatives to help push this legislation in support of Native people here on what they're doing, not what you think that they should be doing, but actually what they're doing and how to support that. What they want to be, or their intention is, whether what you think they should be doing. I think that's so powerful. Um, and I want to also underscore this erasure through making participation in the process so difficult. You know, the more hoops you have to jump through, voter suppression. It's like, I wonder why certain people are suppressing certain votes in certain communities, right? Um, yeah, there are those tactics of, of the dominant powers, you know, powers that be. And they know that it works. They know that it works. And so that's why we, you know, the system stays the way that it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's functioning exactly how it was designed to function. Exactly, yeah. That's a, that's a really, I think, to drive that point home and home and home. <laughs> um, yeah, I also wanted to ask you a bit about Horton um, and how you came to that, where it resonates with you. Um, because I just love your sort of fun, bubbly, engaging teaching style that, you know, it's also just this like codified, you know, it's such a beautiful, like 
older form and then you bring such this beautiful originality to it. So yeah, I'd like to hear about how you came to it, you know, why you love it, why you teach it, all that. Yeah, first of all, thank you. I'm glad that you like the way that I teach and my enthusiasm. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that means a lot because I mean, I think especially in 2020, uh, codified forms are often looked at as archaic and not necessary and a thing of the past. Um, which I guess to a degree, yes, but if we are as innovative and as enthusiastic as those pioneers were, it's not as archaic as we think it could, that we think it is. Um, so how did I come to it? I came to Horton through college. So um, one of my professors, Naila Randall Bellinger, who has become an amazing friend and mentor to me um, over the years, really was teaching this at school. So before I went to college, I didn't really know any, you know, modern dance was not what I know it to be now. Um, and so that was really my first experience. And the thing about the Horton technique that I loved was that it wasn't something that was like unattainable. There could be multiple different types of bodies in the room and there's always a space for you and your body, which in ballet, I had, you know, a lot of struggles because I'm not, physically I wasn't born with the type of facility that you need to be able to do ballet successfully. And so that always felt sort of like a downer for me. Um, but the Horton technique, because it's so anatomically corrective and the exercises were really focused on your, your personal anatomy and not the anatomy of another person, whether that be the person in the room, in the front of the room that's instructing you or the students that are dancing with you. Um, it really gave me a lot of agency over my body to explore and find the things that work for me. So it was quite liberating. And then as I become, you know, older, I was like, you know what, I really want to be able to teach this and teach it effectively. Um, and so I went to a pedagogy program at the ALA school. I've done a lot of my own research. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the studio just really understanding what this what anatomy is and then what anatomy is in relationship to Wharton so that I can more effectively teach in the room, right? There's going to be lots of people. This past weekend, I had somebody that was 14 and I had someone that was 70. Different experiences, different pathways to dance, and yet both of those people were able to be in the room and feel like they had agency and had their artistic expression and all of it was valid and all of it was beautiful. Watching them was very beautiful to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really enjoyed that part of the, of the Horton technique. Um, and then the other thing that I'll say is, you know, Horton was heavily influenced by Native Americans. And so <laughs> for me, there's, a, I mean, a, amongst other cultures as well, including right. um, some of the Asian cultures, Etc. But for me, I really have latched on to like this idea of reclamation mm -hmm. through the through the oh, technique. And yeah, so what yeah, is yeah. it for me, even though, you know, he was inspired by Native Americans and actually participated in a lot of Native American um, activities right. on the West know. Coast, the West Coast and the East Coast are, are different cultures. But what does that mean for me to be able to reclaim that technique? as a native person and put that in my body and then process that and share that out. Um, there's just been like really something interesting and exciting that's been happening for me. And I think that that connection enthusiasm is what people experience when they take my class. It's really about, it's really my personal connection to the work anatomically and to the history of how it's become what it is. Um, and then of course, I believe in codified forms. Um, and so I'm really excited because in Boston, the good and the bad is that there's not a lot of codified forms. So the good is like, there's plenty of space for me to do with what I want. Um, and sometimes the challenge is like, there's just not enough codified stuff. So it gives me even more um, motivation to keep doing this work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for educating us. There's all these things that I didn't know about Native history and Native involvement in dance that you're, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, and I, you were talking about this is space for all bodies, right, and how that's not necessarily in ballet. Like, I have so much appreciation for the art form of ballet, but, you know, you interrogate, like, there's a lot of problematic things there. Um, yeah, and I'm, you know, on that theme of all for all bodies and um, physically accessible, I'm wondering about how you're intentional about creating community in your classes, you reference that a little bit, that everyone feels that, that connection when they come. Um, but what approach do you use and would you recommend to really 
create that atmosphere where everyone feels connected and like they're welcome. Yeah, so I'm gonna give very specific things that I do. Pre-COVID, one of the things that I do is when people come to my class, they come and they check in with me, I write everyone's name down and I make sure to make eye contact with them, say hello, mm -hmm. ask them their name and tell mm -hmm. them welcome, welcome to the class. I'm so happy that you're here. Ask them a little bit about themselves. Have you danced before? Have you not danced? Okay, don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna have a good time. Thank you so much. And then the class goes on. As the class is happening, I'm very intentional about saying everybody's name at least once. Mm. And so one, that's a practice for me to like check in. Like, do you know these people's names? <laughs> these are human beings that are in here that are having an experience, but also so that people can feel seen. Because I think that there's a lot where we get we get sort of. I've been in a lot of spaces. Um, throughout my career where it's like you're just sort of the number or you're the dollar you paid your 15 20 dollars to be in class and like I don't I'm not really focused on whatever it is because like I got my money and like good for you and to me after going through those types of experiences and seeing people doing that I was like okay that's something that I don't really want to do and also like I don't like the way that that feels on for me when that happens and so um, I'm constantly thinking about how to engage with people and, and allow them to be seen. And then again, this is pre COVID, you know, halfway through the class where we're like, okay, we're going to get a sip of water. I'm like, okay, say hello to your neighbor. Say hi, because you have something in common with that person already. Y'all decided to come to this class. So regardless of how you arrived here, whether someone referred you or you just like started on the website or whatever, something brought all of you here. And so you're already connected to the people that are in the room. So say hello, you know, and that type of, yeah, that type of um, prompt, I think really helps to sort of build that community. And then going further out, um, I started doing rep classes so that people that want to perform, right? I mean, there's not a lot of spaces for adults to perform where they feel comfortable because a lot of the opportunities are sort of like these like professional ideas in the company and like we have rehearsal, you know, 52 weeks out of the year and we're going to do a performance and like I have that space with my group. But also like what about the adult dancers that are like, I got six weeks. <laughs> I'm willing to commit for six weeks and like do a thing, you know, show a piece of a work in progress or whatever. And those rep classes have really built a lot of community. Um, the pe there's a lot of people that have moved away from Boston. As we know, Boston is very transient. People are here for school. They're here for work for a few years and then they leave. And we still, I still have connections with people from six years ago that are now when I'm teaching Instagram classes, they're like, I'm so glad that you're teaching because yeah. I have connection to you. And they maintain connections with themselves as well. While also being able to bring in their family members. So when we have our many performances, my family members get to see like, oh, this is this thing that you go to every single week. And like, this is what you're working on. Wow, this is so cool. And it gives us an opportunity to all come together and like have an activity, you know, on a Sunday or a Saturday, whatever the performance is, and really be in, in space and in conversation like that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about community is that I am an emailer. <laughs> when it comes to my class, I'm like, okay, hi. I can't wait to see you. Like, for instance, for now, post, now we're in this pandemic and we can't, I can't connect with people in, in face to face when we're in the studio, we're keeping distance. And so I send out an email before class and say, I'm so happy that you're going to be here, blah, blah, blah. These are things that, you know, to look forward to or whatever. And I think that that type of communication with the students also engages them. And then when they come into the space, they already know that like someone has made contact with them or I, I have made contact with them. And so they already feel sort of welcomed even if they're nervous to come on the first day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes me think of COVID. What, what has the teaching experience been like? What, what's been challenging? What have you learned? What's been fulfilling? Um, yeah, if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so COVID has been an experience as I know that we all, you know, are going through the same thing. Um, it's been a lot of ease at times and a lot of challenges for me. Um, the big challenges on one side were two things, my ego, <laughs> for real, and technology, right? So in the beginning, I was like, oh, this is going to be a few weeks. I would, I'm not teaching online. Like, my work cannot be done online. I need person-to-person -person contact, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And then I was like, oh my God, no, we're really doing this. And I'm losing connections with people that are important to me. 
Um, and I'm starting to like get a little loopy in my house. I mean, there's times in here that I was like, this apartment is not big. And I was like pacing. I was pacing in here and I was like, oh no, I need to be in my body. I need to be moving and I need to be with other people. And however that's going to manifest is very important to me. Right. So then the challenge, then the challenge became technology. Like what's Instagram live? What's Zoom? Do I want to use Zoom? Do I want to use WebEx? Do I want to use Microsoft Teams? Like what works well? The sound, the this, the that, like all of those things were really um, big challenges that I had to face because I'm a dancer and I fully dance mostly all the time. I am not tech savvy at all. As a matter of fact, I'm very proud of myself. All these months later, <laughs> I'm here on Zoom. I have my office looks like it's like organized. I have lighting. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, so yeah, so, so a lot of the challenges were around that, but then the upside is like, you know, I think that I have even more engagement with my classes because people are just in a space of sort of desperation to be in their bodies, you know? And, and I say that also in reference to myself, that I want, I need to be connected to me. I need to be rolling down. I need to like talk and be in conversation with my, with my movement and with myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really been quite a journey where I think that uh, having four classes a week now in a pandemic when people are like the arts are, it, you know, it, then the arts are struggling, of course, but I think that there's definitely been a silver lining to be able to offer something that people find value in, where we can build community. And, and I think that consistency builds strength. So even that consistency in knowing I have class every week, I'm going to you know, see Jenny or like me and my friends, this is going to be our one and our one and a half hour time that we like spend time together. And it's just for us. I think that that's been really um, important and also, you know, just great. I'm happy that we're on this side of things. Of course, I wish that it wasn't this and that we were back just in the studio full time, but I'm grateful that I stepped up to the challenge and I really feel comfortable virtually now. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to like maintaining this and then continuing it forward because I think that and this is the last thing I'll say about this, but I think the uh, I would have never tried to do anything virtually, and so like I believe that this virtual aspect is going to stay a part of my practice probably forever, <laughs> even when things open fully because it's just opened the door to more uh, connection with people in a way that I would have never thought about had I not been given this. Um, this challenge to back up against, you know. 100%, beautiful. Yeah, um, so tell us, is there anything we can support, we can follow, we can get involved in that you or your company is, is doing? Yeah, so actually I, I have sat with this um, and made sure that I wrote something because I want to be very clear. Um, <laughs> it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge um, in some ways, just resisting this idea, this capitalist idea of like, I need to be producing something. I need to be doing something all the time. Um, so really, um, my group and my dance collective, we've been on a hiatus since the quarantine has started, and I'm very much okay with that. Um, there have been many shifts for all of us during this time, um, and I believe in the importance of rest and space. And so we've been taking class as individuals and, and together. We check in from time to time, but this pandemic has really um, given me a lot to think about. I've been sitting with many questions, including what to do with my art, um, what does it look like, and what impact do I want to have going forward. To me, I think that it's not super, for, like, to me, it doesn't feel as fulfilling to just like put a show together and like record it or like go to a space and do it outside. Like, I don't really need that anymore. And I, I even, you can hear me hesitating in how I'm saying that because I'm like, I can't believe I'm saying this. But there's something else and I'm not sure what that something else is. So I'm trying to, you know, be patient with that. Um, many of us in my collective are working on individual projects. Um, I personally have a few things that I'm working on for 2021, and those include uh, my visions of what dance can do when applied to government, um, which is very exciting. Be on the lookout for announcements on that stuff. Uh, when dance is used to intentionally process personal experiences as a collective, um, and then I'm also working on some solo work that I'm developing, um, but as a dance collective, I, I don't have like a we have a performance on, you know, November 25th or like something like that. We're really taking time to 
be intentional to be with ourselves mm -hmm. and figure out what is it that we need to reflect back, right? I think that sometimes when you're going through something, you need that time to go through it, have it hit, right? The pandemic hit, go through that, be depressed. I feel like I was definitely depressed. Go through all those things, process that afterwards, rest, and then figure out, okay, what am I going to reflect back out of this experience? Not, it's a pandemic. Okay, I'm going to go do a Zoom performance. Like, to me, that feels like a very anxious, for me, it's a very anxious response just to be responding. And I want to be a lot more thoughtful um, and processing and making sure that what I'm making makes sense for me and is going to make sense for the next seven generations on, like, a hundred years from now, they're going to be looking at us like, what did they do? And I want to just be that voice that says rest in space is okay. You can do that. And that that's really important. We need that. That's, that's beautiful. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah, this idea of coming from capitalism of like, you need to, the rat race, you need to produce, you need to, you know, you need to innovate and do this multi-level marketing and hashtag the hustle, right? And dancers get wrapped up in that very easily also because their career feels short. You know, like when, how long can I do this? Right. Is it, it remains an open question. Um, there's just always so much, like there's the passion of the work, wanting to be involved in the work, but also just the economic realities. Like right? you can go to rehearsal and then you got to go to your waitress shift, you know, something like that. Um, so I appreciate you naming that. And I think that's hundred percent valid, like 120% valid. Um, and really important to, to put out there um, because I, I super appreciate all of these performances that are happening and these, these artists that are finding a way because they're like, I want to create. I want to keep putting these out. I think art is important right now. I think there's a space for that. And I think there's also a very important space for what you're talking about. Um, so thank you. I think I always have something to share. I always have, <laughs> I always have something to say. I, always, I mean, because I'm constantly processing. I'm constantly thinking. Right. about all of these things and I think and that's that, wonderful you're, you're in t an intentional and mindful person so it's, it's yeah. wonderful and I think that I would also like to just ask your audience to support the arts you know support the things that even though dance I think often is looked at in this country and in our society as a form of entertainment only that's not true um I think that the way that it's presented to us and the structure and the society and, and where it's placed allows us to believe that that's true, um, but it's not. Movement is our first form of communication. Movement is something that transcends and goes across language barriers and all of that. Um, being in your body is really important. I think, I think that that's something that we've all experienced during this pandemic. And so I would just um, encourage people to donate to whatever arts organization that you want to, any of them, <laughs> they all need help. Donate to individual artists. You can donate to me. I have Venmo and PayPal and Cash App. Um, <laughs> or also you can just take class. I mean, I, I have a yeah. lot of class options. And so you can yep. reach out to me and I'll be happy to, to share that with you. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get that info up for sure. Great. Yeah, just whatever you do, be part of keeping the arts alive, I would say, and making the most of this crazy time. So we can come out better on the other side, right? Not just going back to normal. We can get to somewhere better. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unless you have something else to share, please do. But yeah, that's that's all I have. And yeah, I thank you so much for, for coming today. For I, would say time follow, I would say follow me on Instagram because that's where I'm the most active. That's actually my address. It looks like I'm in a home right now, but I live on Instagram.com. Uh, <laughs> my handle is modern i feel that i feel that <laughs> modern underscore connections is where you can find me and thank you so much Robin, for reaching out um you're always so supportive of me you're always like in my corner like hey i have this thing i have that thing and like i super appreciate <laughs> it um yeah thank you so much and thank you for having this platform for all of us we we all we yeah. need it yeah absolutely it's, it's my thing i i raise up that's what i love to do all right, so thank you so much, everyone. Please remember to like and subscribe. If you liked our conversation today, we have many more coming, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye, thank you.